Good morning, everybody. My name is Robert Lamb. I am a senior fellow and director of the program on crisis, conflict, and cooperation here at CSIS. Um, welcome and thank you for coming um, there between Emancipation Day, Holy Week, spring break, and a red line train breakdown. Um, I'm, I am pleased to see that, that we actually have a pretty reasonable turnout given the, uh, um, the, the prevailing winds. Um, the, uh, the prevailing winds also being a, a declining interest in, uh, in the region as far as I've uh, seen over the past couple of years, which has been uh, a bit sobering. Um, I am very pleased to have with me here today um, uh, some folks from the uh, Center for International Private Enterprise who are going to be talking about uh, some work that they've been doing on Pakistan um, in partnership with uh, a group called Prime. Um, the, uh, I'm just going to, it's the Policy Research Institute of Market Economy um, based in, um, uh, in Islamabad, I think, right? Um, and so, uh, believe it or not, I actually have three people here with me. Um, the third is in, um, uh, Mark Schliefer is the Regional Director for Eurasia and South Asia at the Center for International Private Enterprise, um, or SIPE, if you, if you pronounce it. Um, and, um, uh, has uh, sort of overall responsibility um, uh, for Sipe's relationship with this particular project. Um, Ali Salman is actually on the telephone from Islamabad with us, um, but it's where he's probably missing dinner uh, right about now. Um, he's the author of several studies and monographs um, uh, for, for different media publications and is the person who led the, uh, the work on the scorecard that he's going to be presenting later today, um, well, just for minutes actually. Um, and Kuram Hussein is a Pakistan scholar at the um, Asia program at the Wilson Center, uh, who will be uh, um, our discussant uh, for, uh, for this conversation. Uh, before I turn it over to, um, to Mark to introduce the project, um, I wanted to just briefly go around the room so, so I mean, it's a small enough group that, that we can all know who each other are. Um, so I'll just model brief. I'm Robert Lamb, uh, Senior Director, uh, Director and Senior Fellow um, at CSIS. Um, I've already introduced you. So, sir. Hi, John Sullivan with SIPE. Okay. Um, and I, sorry, I will ask you to use the microphones um, because we are, we're videotaping it. We're not live streaming this on the internet, um, but we are videotaping it and we'll post it afterwards. Um, so this is not an off the record, intimate, private round table. This is a public conversation that um, thousands of people will watch via iTunes U. Um, so to turn the microphone on, there's a little, uh, little button in the front. Thanks. Uh, my name is Kurt Hageman. I'm from the uh, global, global sector at SIPE. You also don't need to get really close to the microphone. <laughs> I am April Snedeker, Program Assistant for Eurasia and South Asia at SIPE. Hi, I'm Leah Gregg. I'm with DAI. I'm Ellen Vanik, and I'm also with the I'm also with DAI. I'm Kat Cooley, also with DAI. Uh, Pete Gauthier with USAID's Development Credit Authority. Um, I'm Perka Ahmed. I'm at SIPE, and I'm currently at SICE. I'm John Sampson with International Relief and Development. Kim Kim Betcher, SIPE. Anna Dawson, Communications Assistant at SIPE. Uh, Anna Nagrakiewicz, Director of Multi-Regional Programs at SIPE. Uh, Tim Wallace, SIPE. Greg Wilhuck, uh, Director of Government Relations and Afghanistan Program Officer for SIPE. Andrew Wilson, SIPE. Jennifer Anderson, SIPE. All right, so thanks, everyone. Um, so as you know, um, it was about a year ago that, um, that Pakistan held a fairly historic election. Um, it, was, uh, it represented a time when uh, uh, a civilian government survived its entire term without getting overthrown. Um, and was uh, succeeded by a democratically election, uh, de democratically elected civilian government. Um, the uh, the current government PMLN has put out a um, you know a, a policy program uh, 
obviously it deals with a wide range of issues um, on the economic side of things. Um, uh, the, uh, the issues are particularly important because as we all know, Pakistan's uh, economy is, um, uh, it has been in terrible shape for quite a long time. Um, there's a jobs crisis. There is a severe energy crisis that's dragging down Pakistan's ability to raise revenue um, for its businesses to operate um, factories for civilians to um, to have light on at night. Um, and it's been a major drag on its economy. And as well, there's a great deal of poverty and inequality in Pakistan uh, that is also creating uh, an enormous drag on its economy. Um, the, the One of the things that I like about the Center for um, International Private Enterprises, they've been uh, looking at these issues, um, the role of the private sector um, in development for many decades, um, longer than uh, almost anyone else. Uh, they have uh, an extremely high and deep level of knowledge um, about different parts of the world um, and a great deal of experience on the ground and managing projects. Um, and so I'm delighted that um, uh, I had the opportunity this morning to, uh, to partner with, uh, with all of you to, uh, to help release this report. We're very much looking forward to hearing um, the results of the scorecard to see how the PMLN uh, government has done uh, in its first year. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Mark Schliefer uh, for some introductory remarks. Thanks, thanks very much, Bob. And, and uh, thanks, of course, to CSIS for hosting us and for giving us the opportunity this morning to give um, Ali Salman and Prime uh, the opportunity to share their work with uh, with an audience in Washington. Um, I'm just going to make a few remarks before we turn it over to Ali to, to present the results uh, of the scorecard. Um, just give you a sense of the genesis of this project um, and how this research came about. Cypress had a field office in Karachi um, for about seven years. Um, and one of the things that we've done on a regular basis is host a conference of all of the presidents of all of the chambers of commerce from across the country. Um, and uh, when we first opened our office, uh, we, we found that the, the business community was reluctant really to come together around any sort of uh, unified policy message. In fact, getting them even in the same room was rather difficult. Um, with time, we uh, began to see progress in terms of their willingness to to talk about policy issues and to work in a transparent fashion uh, with the government to try to push for an agenda and to speak publicly and to reach out to the media and whatnot. Um, and um, the, the President's Conference that we hosted every year started issuing an annual declaration. Uh, they, they do it in a, in a place in, uh, in Pakistan, not far from Islamabad, called Bourbon, and they call it the Bourbon Declaration, uh, which is an annual sort of summation of their key policy demands for the year. And as Bob alluded to in the, in the run-up to the historic June uh, 2013 elections, we, we knew that we had to uh, encourage our partners in the business community who organized this conference together with us to sort of take it to the next level um, with uh, the increasingly uh, sort of, um, let's say, optimistic signs that we were getting as, as the June 2013 elections neared that the previous government would actually serve out its full term. Uh, we knew that it was important to try to encourage those elections to be contested on a policy basis. Uh, rather than um, rather than personality-based politics, um, so with our with our um, partners in the lead, uh, what they did in that in that conference was they invited representatives of all of the political parties to actually show up, and for the first time, really listen to the business community articulate its needs for policy reform, um, and. Uh, representatives of, of the five, uh, five major parties, including the, the three sort of major parties that contested the elections, sent their uh, chiefs of, of economic policy to this president's conference. 
um, and, and really engaged in a, in a dialogue with the business community for the first time. And one of the demands that emerged was that the parties articulate a concrete policy vision for the elections and write um, an economic uh, platform or a manifesto, as they sometimes call it, an economic agenda as part of their party platform for those elections and actually campaign on that basis. So fast forward to um, after these historic elections, when uh, a new government comes into power, um, we, we were sitting with, with Ali Salman in, in Islamabad, um, and we were talking about what comes next. Um, and we said, well, you know, they, we, we can't just leave it at, at sort of, they, they, you know, they wrote this economic agenda and they campaigned on it, um, and sort of where do we go from here? Um, and the idea that, that came out of that conversation was, well, let's take everything that the government promised to do and write it down and measure their progress in implementing it uh, on a quarterly basis. Um, and uh, then partnering with key players in the business community, let's uh, bring some sort of amplification to that through the media, through debates in civil society organizations and whatnot. Um, and after some time uh, with, uh, with some uh, limited financial and some technical assistance from SIPE, what Ali Salman and his colleagues at the Prime Think Tank came up with is the uh, scorecard project that he'll be presenting to you today. Um, the, the original idea that we had was to, was to try to do this at both the national and at the provincial levels. Um, uh, sort of bearing in mind the constraints of, of doing this for the first time where for now we're doing it only at the national level and um, the approach is pretty simple uh, the government promised to do a lot of things or the then candidates uh, promised to do a lot of things you write them down and you measure them uh, some of this information as Ali will explain uh, can be gathered from public sources various government websites the State Bank of Pakistan. Uh, some of it can be gathered from you know, World Bank or IMF sources. Some of it is pure numbers that you can evaluate. You know, they they promise to. Well, he'll get into the details a little bit, but make certain changes in terms of let's say tax to GDP ratio. It's fairly easy to check whether that's happening or not. Uh, other issues concern more the, the development and passage of legislation, uh, and that tracking takes place um, both by monitoring legislative developments uh, in Parliament and also by uh, monitoring the media. And then um, Ali and his team assign a, um, a, a score to that. Um, what he's actually going to be presenting for you today is the second in a series of scorecards. So um, the elections were in June. It took a little while to ramp the, the project idea up. Um, so the first scorecard came out um, in January, which covered uh, the first um, eight or so months or six, no, sorry, uh, January, six or so months of the new government. Um, and this scorecard today now is going to cover that period from about January until uh, through the end of March. Um, and the idea here is, uh, you know, SIPE's Sipe, planning to keep this going. Uh, on, a, on, a, on a quarterly basis um, for, uh, for at least for the foreseeable future, working with Prime. Um, and um, what's interesting, I think, and, and this sort of just to wrap it up on this, and then I'll turn it over to Ali uh, via, our, via our telephone link, um, is that, um, you know, SIP is, uh, um, our interest in this is not just from, from Pakistan's economic development point of view. Um, SIPE is a democracy organization, and, and our funding for this project, and indeed many of our projects, comes from the National Endowment for Democracy. Um, and so our interest really here is from a government accountability point of view. Um, it's, it's, it's about establishing a track record of performance and interacting with civil society and the business community to put that track record out there publicly so that citizens have the uh, opportunity and the information to make an objective evaluation of their government's performance and then to use that information going forward uh, in, in, their, in their electoral behavior in the future. 
Um, and, you know, the, the idea here is that you've got indigenous groups in Pakistan uh, from the think tank side and the business community side that are, as we, as we would say, you know, holding the government's feet to the fire in terms of, in terms of performance but also looking to improve that performance going forward and also looking to make sure that citizens have the information they need to, to make decisions about what kind of government they want. Um, so um, without, I guess, without any, any further ado, I think I'll, I'll turn it over to Ali and he will uh, present the results to you of the, of the second uh, quarterly scorecard. Thank you, Ali Saman. Please, uh, please proceed with your uh, um, with your presentation. Yeah. Um, hi. Good morning. Um, am I clear and am I audible to all of you? Yes, you are. Please go ahead, Ali. We hear you. Great. Um, so, good morning once again. Um, I'm thankful to Skype and CSIS to um, uh, to provide us um, prime an opportunity to share the, the results of the second tracking report of the government economic agenda. And um, Mark uh, has very, um, already provided you the background um, you know, and the purpose of the, the scorecard uh, reporting. So I'm going to jump over directly. Uh, first, firstly, I'll explain how we measure score, on what criteria do we measure score, how we assign it, and then the results. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to, to share a couple of important things that since we launched this report in January, um, it has been received uh, positively uh, by the press and electronic media. They have run their own stories. And um, I'm told by friends at, uh, in the government that uh, when we circulated the reports the first track and report to the parliamentarians. The Prime Minister of Pakistan actually has asked the Planning Ministry to prepare a, a, a similar scorecard breakdown into ministries and um, the breakdown of manifesto goes into ministry. So this shows that this kind of work, if consistently carried out in an objective manner, uh, does have an impact in terms of raising citizens' voice and building pressure on the government to perform. So um, I might uh, now um, I, I am assuming that the, the presentation is on. So I am um, can it be turned to this slide number two, where how do we score them is mentioned? We're there, Ali. Yeah. So um, so the score is essentially uh, assigns a score on each of the economic goal. We have identified, uh, we have break down, broken down the manifesto into 91 quantifiable and measurable goals. And um, basis on the information available, we have given on each indicator a score from 0 to 10. And as you can see on your slides, um, out of 10, we have 2.5 for policy development and 2.5 for institutional reforms or governance, and 5 for implementation. We have uh, developed central rules in which we say that if the policy has been developed or already exists, then we give them a score of 2 to 2.5. Um, obviously, uh, besides policy, you need uh, governance and implementation machinery um, and institutional reforms to carry out. So the score is assigned on the basis of the uh, level of progress, and lastly, the implementation uh, gets the score. So each of those 91 indicators then gets score on the basis of these three, these three parameters, on the basis of the data available. And, and then um, we also have rules for assigning zero if the progress has been reversed, and no negative marking is done because we believe that this would affect the, the average, the non-weighted average disproportionately. We assign nil if no progress is made. Um, and we also note that since it is the very beginning and it's still the first year of a democratic government which has full five years, so we write as yet no development um, in, in the indicators in which no development has, has, um, has taken place. 
The key difference between as yet no development and zero nil is that in the latter, uh, as yet no development, the score of that area is then computed, is not computed in, the, in computing the average. Um, so we give a fair uh, margin of the government uh, to the government to in terms of perform over next um, four years. And then the average of the subcomponents are taken and then we assign um, to the overall um, areas. The, the PMLN manifesto, in, if you can turn to the next slide, please. This is how um, the, the, the scorecard looks like. As I already explained, on the left hand, on the left side column, you have oh, the uh, first chapter of Manifesto Economic Revival. This is uh, just an example. And in the uh, right columns, you have all those scores mentioned with first column, with the second column actually uh, showing the data in terms of baseline. Uh, the baseline is chosen as the 10th June 2013. That is the time when the government took over. <laughs> Excuse me. When the government took over. Um, so we sign scores in, in, on, on three areas, uh, economic revival, energy security, Try to get this link back. <laughs> so, meanwhile, while while we try to get the link back, I'm just going to shoot a quick email to Ali and let him know that the, the phone line is down. So, please pardon me. Maybe while we while we try to get the um, while we try to get the link back, um, we could um, actually ask Coram to make a make a few quick remarks so that we're we're not. Um, there we go. All right. So we're going to try to get the link back, but um, do just just maybe give a couple quick remarks and then we'll we'll try to turn it back over to Ali. Okay. I'll, um, be. <clears throat> okay. Um, actually, I don't have much to say about the methodology other than perhaps uh, um, some concern regarding how weightage is uh, going to be assigned to the various uh, criteria, the legislative and policy developments, institutional reforms and implementation. Uh, because some of the measures that are being talked about um, are, are more difficult than others. It's easier to pass legislation, it's harder to implement it. And um, so, so perhaps, uh, you know, um, as, as per the methodology, I'm not sure I think uh, both would, would end up carrying the same weight. And uh, it might be worth uh, in, in subsequent uh, reports to actually assign weightages. Uh, of course, that becomes a very subjective enterprise. Um, and number two, some of these promises are easier to deliver on than others. Uh, so, so clearly, it's a, a way where the methodology can focus the, the, the attention on, um, on, on some of them. Uh, rather than just uh, uh, giving us a numerical value for each. Uh, it's entirely possible Ali already has ideas on all of this. So, um, so perhaps we, you know, once we've had a chance to hear him out uh, on that. Um, number two, the, the baseline, uh, the choice of the baseline. Now, 10th June 2013 is definitely when the um, um, political career of the government began. Um, but the economy actually had been operating for, from long before. 
um so 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 it's it's a, it's a bit uh, tricky actually to uh, to establish a baseline in these kinds of assessments because depending on where you set the baseline you're going to get a different result and um um it it might be worth giving a little more thought uh, how that'll work uh, apologies for uh, um for that we're just going to we're just going to try to uh reestablish the connection Um, hello, this is Ali. Hello, Ali. Uh, not sure what happened there. Uh, we lost you for a minute, but we are uh, happy to hear you back, um, back in action. Um, so please, uh, please feel free to uh, continue the presentation. Thanks. Okay, thank you. We are on slide number four, economic revival, and I was just explaining a few scores. Um, now you can see on the right side column, you, you the various scores have been assigned, and the total score out of 10 in the economic revival government has received a score of 4.47. Um, and in the second row on the top, you actually are seeing the overall score, which is the aggregate score of the three components. Now let me give you a perspective here. Uh, for instance, the uh, the targets set in the tax reforms, tax administration, uh, lowering of tax rates, facilitation of tax collection for the taxpayers, um, increasing the tax to GDP ratio. These are all, uh, there are about 15 uh, sub-components which contribute to an assessment of where the government is standing in terms of tax reforms. And as you can see, this is the lowest score which the government has received is 1.75 out of these 10 uh, components in economic revival. And we view this is sorry a to, sorry to uh, interrupt, Ali. Public. Could you clarify what uh, could you clarify what slide you're on, please? Yeah, sorry. Uh, this is slide number four, economic revival. Great. Thank you. Thank you. We're with you. <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, so I was explaining the tax reforms issue in which the, this out of uh, the, the 10 uh, scored subcomponents, the government has received the lowest score. <coughs> Similarly, the, the state-owned enterprises, <coughs> sorry, the state-owned enterprises, uh, the uh, government is, has promised to sort of start the privatization and the process has begun but it seems that the process is, is rather slow at the moment. Um, there are uh, opportunities for Pakistan in terms of industrial growth and, uh, and also trade development. Uh, Pakistan has received uh, GSP plus status from the EU, the concessionary tariff um, regime. So we hope that this will be used as, um, you, know, you know, this will be used to boost up the, the trade and the export from Pakistan. There are some indicators that the, uh, the the private sector has actually grown in terms of, for instance, uh, its uh, its excess or its usage of the commercial credit over one year has uh, grown exponentially. And when you compare uh, this figure in terms of uh, one year, the private sector credit has 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 increased by four times. So. Uh, these are all the factors which have been considered while giving uh, scores in various components which right now are in the front of your screen. Um, and as I said, <coughs> just to repeat my point, the, uh, the score in the area of economic revival is 4.47. If uh, there are any clarification uh, questions uh, on this slide, I'll be happy to stop for, for a second before moving on. Oh, please continue. Okay, so then uh, let's turn to the next slide, please. Which is again uh, one of the most important area in which the government is now targeting the energy security. You can see uh, the results in ten components, um, and as I said earlier, the the the, the PMLN the PMLN party has actually done um, a good job in terms of defining <coughs> their exact goals of how, for instance, they are going to sustain 
or uh, they are going to ensure energy security for the country. However, the very first goal which they announced has not been achieved. They, uh, for, uh, you know, for an integrated energy policy, the institutional arrangement uh, decided was that we will have one <coughs> in a con integrated ministry of energy and natural resources, but we have not achieved that. So you don't see any development in that area. Um, and then you can see various components of uh, uh, the, elect the energy sector. Uh, one area of maybe your interest would be number five, which is <coughs> the permanent um, elimination of circular debt. Circular debt is the um, payment which are stuck in the system because of uh, defaults and because of uh, the poor collection of bills by by state enterprises or by even by private uh, customers. Um, although this government uh, <coughs> temporarily solved this problem last year by paying around five billion dollar in one go, which was the uh, which was the outstanding um, component, which was the outstanding payment to the electricity producing companies. Um, again, uh, the outstanding debt in in this in this uh, sector is about four, uh, 3.5 billion dollars. So therefore, you can see in the area five, uh, circular debt, the score is low at 3.25. <coughs> um, area number nine, high priority to import gas through pipelines may be of interest uh, to our friends in US because <coughs> the, the government committed, for instance, that it will, um, it will meet the shortfall in gas by pipeline agreements with the, within the region. Uh, and obviously, due to the geopolitical situation, not much progress has, has been made on this. So the score is, is low at two. <coughs> um, there, there are um, certain reforms beginning to happen, but um, uh, the, the pace of the institutional reforms <coughs> is rather slow at the moment. And um, in the energy sector, we have uh, we have seen uh, China being very actively pursuing various investment opportunities in Pakistan, um, and um, uh, we can say that we are expecting positive development. But so far, mostly the um, the agreements are yet to be materialized. Uh, there are MOUs uh, signed, but at in uh, exception of one agreement, there are many. Um, energy related areas in which more investment is needed. So uh, we continue on this area, energy security, and move on to the next slide. This should be uh, slide number six. Um, this is the continuation of energy security, remaining five, uh, remaining five components. Um, and, and as you can see, that in the very first area, development of new coal fields and setting up of new coal-fired power plants, there is a high score of seven. Um, Pakistan, uh, it is well known uh, in the area of uh, southern Punjab, uh, southern uh, Pakistan, province of Sindh. Uh, Pakistan has very vast um, reserves of coal uh, or lignite, which is not exactly coal, but there is an immense opportunity for investment into uh, of energy. And uh, the government have signed up uh, projects and have started projects recently, um, or commission projects recently in, in that area. Um, Pakistan had also uh, exhibited a potential in hydro power, uh, but then there has been a lot of uh, political tensions by and political uh, and resistance by smaller provinces on certain dams, and therefore there has been no uh, development in that area. Um, Pakistan does have alternative energy like like solar energy and other sources, uh, and there have been positive progress um, in that and in, in that as well. Ultimately, the government has declared, following um, that, that they want to establish a sort of a wholesale market for electricity, which is a very ambitious uh, goal. Uh, but uh, what we see is. Um, something different happening. The government has announced, for instance, direct contracting with the, with companies 
in um, in discussions with the with China, with with, with Russia, with Turkey, and uh, so con- direct direct contracting has its own issues, and the score is, um, is is nil at this moment in terms of development of the wholesale energy market. So the in energy sector, the final result is the score is 4.34 out of 10. And now I'm going to move to the next slide, which is the third and the last area in our um, in our assessment. This is relatively very, uh, in a very few indicators are available, um, in which the government has um, continued the previous uh, uh, government People's Party government program of uh, uh, Benazir Income Support Program, and it has in actually increased. The, uh, the amount available in, in what is uh, well-managed conditional cash transfer. Um, and therefore, uh, the government has received a high score of seven. And also, uh, the, the spending on non-pension social protection has, has increased in last budget. Um, although uh, there is another province pro- promise on the agenda, legislate the right to food, but so far no development has been happening. Uh, there is a discrepancy, as you can see, that the, we only have three uh, indicators in this area. Uh, so obviously, as compared with 15 components in the energy security or 10 components in economic revival, we only have three. Average will still be computed. And it has, you can say, uh, a slightly disproportionate effect on the overall, uh, overall score. Uh, and just to summarize now, this is the summary slide. Uh, slide number eight, overall score for your um, reference. This is where relatively Pakistan economic performance um, in the light of manifesto of the government and in light of our assessment stands right now. Um, about 4.47 in economic revival, 4.34 in energy security and social protection, 6.5, leading to an average of 5.1. Now. Just to put you in perspective, when we did this score in January, the overall score was 4.4. So you can see that uh, there has been some increase um, in the performance from 4.4. The overall performance is at by 5.1. Now, we can also say that government has also made some efforts to reduce the size of government as well as and lessen taxation and regulatory burden um, overall um, in the economy. Now, what are the priority areas um, where the government should be moving? Again, we have identified certain areas from the manifesto which need government attention. One of this is actually reduction it's in the in the government expenditure. Um, and not just um, in uh, the expenditure on um, on the presidency or prime minister secretariat. Um, then the government must gear up its effort on the privatization of state-owned enterprises. Um, and one important prerequisite for that is the setting up of independent and professional boards um, and introducing corporate governance in the state-owned enterprises which um, was legislated uh, last year. Um, incidentally, also SAIP, Pakistan, played a positive role in that. Um, and then we, con- then we continue to the next slide, number 10, and um, we emphasize that the government must um, uh, reduce the number of federal and provincial taxes and also the rate of taxes. Um, and uh, so encourage need to encourage more people to actually bring in the tax net rather than um, encouraging them to evade uh, the taxation mm-hmm. government has geared up its efforts to open up trade with india and also increased its efforts in afghanistan but um, my view is that our view is that it has stopped a short of uh, granting mfn status to india um, apparently for security and political reasons at the moment. Uh, in, in our view, it must, it must go on and uh, open up the borders further. Um, there is an apprehension in the business circles 
that government is uh, in the name of regulation maybe extending and um, its control over the business uh, through arbitrary controls on uh, the regulators such as uh, security and exchange commission and competition commission uh, that needs to be avoided uh, the regulatory environment has to be maintained as an independent uh, regulators um, and um, you know lastly the government needs to continue its you know improve its relationship with the with the private sector now the next slide um, is this how you can actually ensure uh, the energy security in this country um, in the past it has happened that uh, we have given uh, subsidies to the consumers and extraordinary incentives to the energy producers but we have not really uh, come closer to com an open and competitive energy market particularly in the transmission and distribution and also partially in, in, in generation which has uh, uh, which has meant that Pakistan is significantly sh uh, facing shortfall of energy um, and the business and industries are all um, waiting for uh, sort of revival in terms in, in energy infrastructure um, and, and therefore we believe that this has to be continued as an, you know, one of the top most important priority for this uh, government. Right, so I think I'm done with the, with the slides. I am um, again thankful to all of you in, in DC this morning and um, you can take questions uh, right now or later after other uh, guests have spoken. Great. Thank you very much Ali. Um, that's a, a very comprehensive view of, um, of the government's policies um, and how they've, uh, how they've done in the past nine months um, in, in implementing them. Um, I'd like to turn it over, I should say back over to, uh, to Mr. Hussain, um, uh, uh, who's a, uh, obviously a very well-regarded uh, columnist and journalist um, uh, in Pakistan um, in residence uh, at the Wilson Center. Um, and very knowledgeable about um, you know, all all, uh, all aspects of, uh, of Pakistani politics and policy. So, um, uh, turn it over to you. Thanks. Thanks, Robert, for that very kind introduction, and uh, also a, a shout out to Ali Salman in Islamabad for um, um, a great uh, job done with uh, uh, preparing these uh, uh, or tracking these manifesto targets so carefully and so closely. Uh, like this. Um, I've already shared a couple of thoughts regarding the methodology that's being followed here. Um, uh, so I'd like to, uh, I suppose, uh, react to, uh, uh, to, to the picture that's emerging uh, from uh, or, or what this uh, uh, report is actually telling us. Um, number one, there is uh, very little doubt that the overall st economic story of uh, this new government in Pakistan is a positive one thus far. Uh, and, the, and, and by and large, the, mani the, the tracking report is actually uh, showing that too. The improvement between the last report and this one in overall achievement of targets um, is, is speaking to that. Um, all of the various institutional voices, the independent institutional voices whose job it is to track macroeconomic and structural uh, developments in the economy closely, uh, concur on this point. The State Bank of Pakistan and its uh, monetary policy announcements has um, has um, echoed a, a, a very positive sentiment. The IMF, in its uh, first and second review, has also echoed a very positive sentiment uh, that, by and large, things appear to be moving in the right direction. Uh, GDP growth rate uh, growth is increasing. Large scale manufacturing is uh, uh, leading um, the, the, this turnaround. Um, <coughs> the fiscal deficit and expenditures are under control. Revenue measures are being implemented. So by and large, there appears to be a very positive story coming out, and uh, and I think Ali Salman's report and the report by Saip um, is 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 also uh, echoing that. It's not uh, certainly giving us any reason to doubt what the IMF and the State Bank um, have already told us. Now, having said that, uh, it's also equally important to understand, I think, that uh, this was in fact the easy part. Um, turning around the overall macroeconomic indicators um, was uh, quite possibly the uh, uh, first order of priority for sure, uh, but, uh, but, but the pa part of the story that came the easiest, uh, number one. The real story begins now, 
and that's something that uh, uh, occurred to me even more so uh, and I think um, the, the last two slides that Ali Salman showed us uh, the 10 uh, bullet pointed one the, 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 the priorities going forward if you look at each one of those points that were that that, that was on the screen you you really get the the feeling that uh, the the game is only just beginning uh, and uh, the third review of the IMF that is scheduled for May uh, will be held and then shortly after that whatever agreed targets um, come out of that review will be written into the budget in June and that fiscal year and the implementation of those structural uh, and the pursuit of those structural reforms is really where the game is going to be, uh, uh, get going in earnest. Um, before going on to that, let me just uh, add that uh, the government has been helped along in, uh, in, in turning around the macroeconomic picture uh, by, a couple of, uh, by a couple of things. One was the arrival of unanticipated liquidity from abroad. The, the reserve target, the government was in a very tight reserves position up until December of, uh, of the fiscal year and there was not really uh, a clear picture going forward about how they intend to meet their net international reserves targets and uh, how they're going to be able to bring about currency stability which had been a, an, an important part of their, the promises that, that, that they, they had made. So suddenly the arrival of $1.5 billion uh, out of nowhere uh, certainly helped turning, uh, in, in turning around the, the reserves picture. The other is in the, on the fiscal side. Uh, there was um, a considerable amount of help given to the government by the fact that uh, uh, last year, at the right before the end of the last fiscal year, there was a retirement of about 582 billion rupees worth of the circular debt. That was done days before the end of the of the fiscal year last year. And the reason behind doing it days before was so that money, in fact, gets counted in last year's fiscal deficit figures, which are now being reported as 8.8% of GDP. Of course, this year you will not have a retirement on that order of magnitude, plus with such a high base from 8.8%, bringing the, the deficit down to a target of 5.8% will, uh, will, will be helped along. The fiscal side has also been helped by including in the revenue figures um, uh, figures that have traditionally not been included in fiscal uh, areas, such as uh, uh, the universal support fund maintained by the telecom companies for making telecom infrastructure accessible to the poor. Um, that's been brought under, under government control, whereas it used to be an independent fund. Uh, they've also been helped along by an unusually high uh, 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 provincial government surpluses, uh, which in the last report I, I saw before coming here was uh, at 170 billion rupees, more than half of which was accounted for the government by the government of Punjab. Uh, previ the previous government struggled with this issue and struggled with trying to get the government of Punjab to run a provincial surplus to, uh, to, to bring some of that, uh, the, the, that money back into. But going forward, uh, so the macroeconomic picture has been helped along by uh, cleverly adjusting the baseline, and uh, it's also been helped along by, by the utilization of, uh, of, uh, of liquidity. But nevertheless, there is a resumption of confidence that the recent euro bond flotation, for instance, uh, shows that uh, the, the, co the return of confidence is not only a domestic factor, but international investors looking at Pakistan uh, also feel that it's uh, potentially a good bet for five to ten year tenors. Uh, even if at unusually high spreads. Uh, going forward, the real challenges now uh, emanate on the structural side. Those targets are going to be decided in May, um, and implementation is then going to begin as of the, the, the forthcoming budget. Two areas are going to be absolutely central and critical to this, and Ali Salman's presentation uh, uh, touched on both of them. Uh, in fact, gave central uh, place to both of them. One is tax administration, and the other is uh, energy. Um, this is where the government is going to meet its biggest test, uh, because this is where they start touching on the real rackets that, that, that operate beneath the surface. And, uh, and how they deal with this, how, how, they, how they go about uh, uh, bringing the, the, the two pow uh, uh, bureaucracies under control, the, the power bureaucracy and the tax bureaucracy, uh, is going to be an important test. So uh, that's something to keep an eye on. Um, I suppose I can stop here at this point if you want to open discussion. For the Thanks very much. Um, uh, to open up the discussion, let me just um, uh, thank uh, all of our speakers um, for an uh, um, excellent, very interesting and detailed presentation um, on the state of Pakistan's um, economic policy. Um, uh, a question that I had um, uh, for uh, Ali and um, as well for, uh, for, um, for Mark and uh, Kuram, 
um, is um, at the end, uh, Ali, you had a, a list of recommendations. Um, all right, first of all, are you still on the on the line, Ali? Yeah, I am hearing. Oh, excellent, good. Uh, so we we don't have to repeat ourselves. Um, uh, the if um, you know as as the state uh, privatizes um, some of the uh, um, state and enterprises, uh, that obviously reduces revenue. Um, if you're recommending as well um, reductions in tax um, and reductions in in uh, government debt, um, uh, obviously that that will have an effect on government revenue as well. Um, uh, where is the government going to get money to invest in infrastructure um, that is needed? Um, uh, the obviously the international community is is a potential source, but I'm not. It's not clear to me that that increasing uh, dependence on um, international aid is is um, is a policy that that anybody's really recommending. Um, would you care to speak to that issue? Uh, yes, I think it's a very important issue. Um, now, first of all, I think we need to understand and. Um, the government would would create a surplus capital and financial fiscal space for investment in the infrastructure once it stops uh, subsidizing and once it, it uh, stops um, you know um, spending its its money on the on the loss making enterprises. There is uh, estimated about uh, five billion dollars. Every year, the government th throws this money after bad, uh, and then there is another five billion dollar estimated by IMF, which uh, is the revenue loss due to tax exemptions, um, and uh, the the um, concessionary regimes called SROs in Pakistan. Now, uh, these are the sources available within the current fiscal space in Pakistan. And um, I think the priority, therefore, should be to create this and to materialize uh, this this kind of money, uh, which is on the table, to and it will be available for investment over over the next few years. Um, the taxation is a, issue is very sensitive, and I I noticed that when I say that lowering the tax rate, there is a concern that uh, maybe because of poor administration. Pakistan GDP ratio, tax GDP ratio can may even further slide down. But um, I am very confident uh, that you know, this this government actually had achieved in late 90s a fairly high tax to GDP ratio close to 13 percent by actually reducing and simplifying tax structure. Uh, it was un unfortunately 2002 onwards when we had an, um, made a very complicated income tax code. And furthermore, uh, even more complicated sales tax or value-added tax uh, regime. We have moved from a simplified tax to a complicated tax, and we have lost revenue. So I think these are the resources available within the country, and I totally agree that we don't need to depend on aid. Um, the foreign aid is hardly 1% of national GDP. I don't consider this as a, a major driving factor. I mean, there could be, as Khurram uh, rightly uh, pointed out that this, this this one transaction which has helped for now, but I, I I don't think so that we should plan or assume that more such transactions are on the line, and we have to look inside for resources. Um, from what I understand, this government has been quite, uh, uh, or this party has been quite um, um, innovative in being able to raise funds for infrastructure finance in the past. Uh, and the kind of things we're hearing them talk about uh, today indicates that, you know, the, 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 the Prime Minister has spoken about a build-operate transfer basis, for instance, for financing some uh, highway projects. Um, so I, I think raising resources will not be that big of a problem for them, um, depending on the terms that they're, <coughs> that they're willing to offer to, uh, to the. Uh, um, but but the thing is that uh, recovering that money uh, over the course of the next few years um, will be a big issue. Uh, so 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 you're right to flag this as a as a, as a problem, uh, where the funds funds will come from for infrastructure finance, but. Uh, just, um, the the failure of the 3G, 3G um, uh, auction um, recently it seems to me a, a kind of a 
perhaps a, a, a little funner. There was they were expecting two billion dollars and got something on the score of um, bids for what about four hundred million or something. So I just I just wonder well, if. I mean, what's the, with the three G auction? Uh, it, it's yet to take place on the it will take place on the on the twenty third. First of all, um, so we'll know at that point. Now, what's happened is that Reuters has run a story saying that, uh, as per their sources, uh, and they're not citing any named sources. They're claiming that uh, the government has only raised eight hundred and fifty million dollars based on the sealed bids that were submitted on Monday. Um, the government, for its part, particularly the chairman of the, the telecommunications authority, has very strongly gone on the record to deny this, and saying that, and, and says, in fact, because he's seen the sealed bids, he's saying that no, the, uh, in fact, the option is oversubscribed. So we don't yet know uh, what the out- we'll we'll know on the twenty third what the outcome of that is. First of all. Second, the, the amount that they're actually looking for from the auction, if you look at the IMF documents, uh, the, for the balance of payments, uh, the target is about $1.2 billion uh, that they're looking to raise from that auction, of which about something like $200 million, I believe, has already been raised. So it's just $1 billion that's from the auction itself. The Reuters report is saying, well, they've raised $850 million. So even the shortfall there is not as big as what the report is uh, making us believe. The $2 billion figure is just a figure that the finance minister had put up that back in January after a cabinet meeting. So um, um, the, the real figure is actually one point two billion. So, so as usual, uh, more positive picture than this point. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Um, uh, when, uh, when I call on you, please, uh, introduce, well, hey, please turn on the microphone, introduce yourself, and then um, keep your question fairly brief so that we can get as much discussion as possible. Thanks. Yes, Andrew Wilson from SITE. Uh, Ali, your, your presentation uh, seems to uh, indicate that, the, the, as with a lot of with a lot of governments, that the the current government's very good at spending uh, and still has some challenges in, in income. Uh, one of the issues that's plagued Pakistan over the years uh, has been not only uh, expanding the tax base, but making sure that people who do owe taxes pay their taxes in full, and that's always been. A question, uh, especially I guess, in, in terms of, of rural land holders, uh, what progress has this government made, uh, not only in simplifying the taxes you've already indicated, but expanding the tax base for making sure that taxpayers are paying their fair share? Good question, Ali. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you so much uh, for this very important question. I am I am afraid that uh, as our scorecard is also showing, uh, on the tax, government has received uh, the lowest score. Um, on the tax reforms um, so far. So my my immediate answer to this question is um, is that one, the federal government is now consistently saying that, uh, for instance, the imposition of agriculture uh, tax or uh, you know income tax on the agriculture income is a provincial domain after the devolution constitution amendment. So it's not really bothered to uh, to carry out the expansion of the tax um, in that area, um, and, but it really it has not uh, moved ahead in terms of expanding the tax net at the moment. Um, and um, there is, um, as we know, that there is like this large informal sector economy in Pakistan. Um, by any estimate, it is not less than one third of the the GDP, the national GDP. And so, therefore, these are all the taxable um, enterprises, um, you know, which are operating extra legal sphere, but uh, which are not in tax. So, I, I, my, my answer to this question is, I have not seen so far government making any serious attempts to um, reform the tax collection and um, you know, tax infrastructure, uh, except maybe that um, it has published recently direct fees of taxpayers, so it has you know, brought some media attention to those who are paying taxes or those who are paying very low taxes, so that has stirred a lot of media debate and it will in coming days, it was just released yesterday. Um, but I haven't seen um, in terms of um, the reforms, in terms of outreach, you know, the, the government has to take the private sector into confidence that it, it, it means um, serious business and you know it needs to show confidence in those small enterprises which constitutes 90% of our enterprises um, uh, to 
to in, encourage them to register themselves and identify themselves and contribute to, to the national taxation. Um, the government has uh, committed with the IMF to send out something like 70,000 uh, uh, income tax notices to non-filers. Um, I, the IMF is reporting close to 68 or so thousand of those have been sent out. So a very spirited effort appears to have been made. And this is a measure that for about the, the, the last government tried to do for about three separate years and was unable to. So we've actually seen uh, one major uh, tax administration effort, to, at least on the income tax side. The problem is that um, out of the 68 or so thousand income tax notices that were sent out, something like 6,500 of those people actually stepped forward in response to the notice and filed. So you've got a hit rate of about less than 1 in 10. Um, now, how to improve that hit rate in, 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 the, in the subsequent years is, is, is an important challenge. And that's a challenge on the structural side of things. That's a way to try and improve the, the uh, tax administration, the audit powers, um, um, and uh, uh, maybe even legislative changes to try and uh, reduce uh, the role of... Uh, at, anyways, I mean, the, 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 the fact is that, that that presents a challenge. On the sales tax side, the government had in its first budget included some very uh, uh, um, some measures to try and get people to uh, to get themselves registered as sales tax uh, um, agents. Uh, but there was a big hue and cry from the business community against that, and uh, and they caved in. Uh, now these were measures that the previous government had also tried on about three or four occasions, and if you look at the past 20 years, you notice that it's been tried on, on numerous occasions and each time the, the backlash from the business community is too much and the government usually caves in. This one was no different. So, And the IMF actually uh, frowned on that, uh, caving in, uh, so to speak. And then there was also a tax amnesty scheme given to uh, big capital, um, uh, the operators of large scale fixed capital, that if you invest a certain amount of money, you can actually claim uh, a tax exempt status for based on the amount of money that you've invested, uh, which again, the IMF flagged as a tax amnesty scheme and frowned on the practice. So you've got a mixed record emerging. You know, you, you can definitely see the government trying to make an effort on the income tax side uh, and then finding that there are structural constraints. Um, now, whether or not they follow up on those structural constraints is something we'll wait to see in subsequent years. On the sales tax side, you're seeing a lack of will to actually confront the, the unregistered parties. And on the um, large-scale uh, fixed capital side, you're seeing a, a willingness to play ball, so to speak, uh, and in, in, a, in an effort to try and get the tax uh, compliance and, and amount of revenue up um, by, 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 by through some kind of a negotiated process. Yeah, Pete Gauthier with uh, USAID. Um, two quick questions. I guess first would be on the private capital. I think you mentioned that credit's uh, grown about five times. And where is that credit going? Because it doesn't seem to be going to you know, like the heart of the economy, like the SME sector. Is it just going to like, these large big businesses uh, on the international side? And then uh, the second would be on the privatization. Is where are the priority sectors uh, that you see that the privatization should focus and where is it going to be focused going forward? Ali? Yeah, uh, so the, the first question is, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Uh, first question is where the uh, the additional private sector credit is going. Uh, and now the, the data available with the state bank shows that it has um, uh, you know in, invested in very diverse proportion from uh, the textiles to the services. Um, uh, and now you should uh, you should realize that the in, you know that 60 percent of Pakistan GDP is essentially services. Um, which includes um, the wholesale and, and retail operations, um, uh, the, the, ho the hotel industry, and the other services, which are actually the recipients of extra private sector credit uh, takeoff, um, happened um, last year. Also, people have uh, invested in, in the agriculture activities. Agriculture growth um, has been stable over the long run, and it has actually uh, at several occasions, uh, has compensated for um, you know uh, uh, for low performance in in the industrial activity. Um, 
As for the second question, in terms of um, the the priorities for privatization, right now the government is um, actually going for a low-hanging fruit, and the low-hanging fruit is essentially capital market transactions. It is offloading. Um, it has offered uh, to offload its, its shares in in banks, in large oil and gas development corporation and other certain other uh, large entities in which the government is a significant shareholder, though it is not in the management position. Um, the, the other priorities which the government is focusing or announced is the um, couple of electricity utility companies. Um, and sort of the big names in privatization, like Pakistan International uh, Airlines, uh, Pakistan Railways, have uh, it seems to me that have they have been shelved at the moment. Um, the, the the railway uh, minister in charge is actually against the idea of privatization, so it's it's not going uh, to be privatized in any time sooner. Um, Pakistan International Airlines, the national uh, flag carrier, is again um, you know there are efforts to sort of improve its corporate governance. Um, they have uh, they've also are in, you know, about to purchase uh, new aircrafts on dry lease or wet lease. But again, I, I don't see it going towards privatization anytime soon. And, um, and I'm also afraid that there is all, already uh, a political opposition to it, uh, to the entire idea of privatization. In the previous uh, regime, there were a lot of additional employment uh, generated in those state-owned enterprises, and that's not easy to get rid of now that uh, it's very important to understand that in the, in the last government, they, um, uh, by, by, you know, in terms of the law, the, um, there is a 12.5 percent share of, for employees of all state-owned enterprises, um, and the, it has been already implemented in the previous regime. And unless the government revises that law, um, which governs all transaction of privatization, um, or manage a sort of a golden shake hand or other schemes, I think that remains a sort of um, uh, that will decrease the appetite, I would say, for private sector investors in the privatization transaction. More questions. Yeah, Ali, thanks very much. This is uh, John Sampson from International Relief and Development. One of the areas mentioned in your uh, report was the lack of confidence of the private sector, particularly in the economic revival. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more to that, as well as I'd be interested to know how specifically you're tracking that confidence uh, measure for this report. Thanks. Thank you. Ali. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Uh, as I said, uh, we measure essentially on the basis of what the manifesto stated. And in our detailed report, I hope that you have uh, access to a detailed report we issued um, in the email some time back. You mentioned that the, uh, the government had announced the creation of uh, a business council and an economic advisory council in which the private sector is uh, is a participant and it has already created that it has met several times and uh, so it is sort of uh, showing some kind of confidence uh, however uh, the uh, we also looked at uh, the other available uh, measures of private sector confidence there are other surveys available uh, for instance the, there is uh, this overseas chamber um, of commerce which is the representation of all multinationals in Pakistan which uh, recently issued its survey about business confidence in the in the economic fundamentals, and it you know the situation it portrayed was not very hopeful. It it showed very slight improvement over over the last few months in terms uh, of its uh, confidence in the in the in the government economic policy. So our assessment is affected both by what um, you know these these confidence. Uh, measures have resulted in terms of how business community is seeing that and also what government own promises stand for. Thank you.
Hi, I'm Kat Cooley from DAI. Um, I'm not sure, but I think a lot, some of the authority that pushes these or some of the indicators forward has been devolved and really runs at a provincial level. So I was wondering if you could speak to some of the more nuanced differences in pace of reform or um, you know, intensity or thoroughness of reform between Punjab and Sin specifically. Um, and also, if there's anything going on to close the gap between some of the other provinces where I think there's a big disparity. Thank you very much. Uh, so the question is on the um, on the provincial. Uh, you know, can you repeat the question for me, please? It's at the um, since uh, a lot of authorities have, have been devolved to the provincial level. Um, I think the question has to do with um, the uh, the capacity for the national government to um, to implement all of these and how that affects the, the pace of reform. Is that yeah? And to what extent, if you were to tease indicators just related to Punjab out of the national averages, you know, like what kind of disparity would you find, and is there any effort to close that gap? Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> So actually, after the devolution uh, took place, um, uh, the province of Sindh has established uh, its own uh, authority for tax collection. The province of Punjab has also uh, followed. Now, this is the this is the collection on services uh, for sales tax or the value added tax. Uh, the 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 income tax, the custom duties, and other direct taxation, and and most of the indirect taxation still remains with the federal government. Um, and um, in in most of the economic policy matters, the federal government still uh, has the lead in terms of uh, the um, the decision making. There is uh, an increasing role for an interprovincial um, body um, uh, in which the provinces are represented, Economic Coordination Council, chaired by the Prime Minister, um, which uh, which has the authority to. Um, to take decisions at national level. So, by and large, I would say that um, the where the, for instance, the sales tax, the collection of sales tax on services have de have been has been devolved. Province of Sindh has actually shown a good promise. Uh, the collection in by by the provincial authority has actually increased, and. Uh, that Punjab is likely to follow, but uh, so far I don't have figures uh, with Punjab government. Uh, but I, I know for sure that Sindh government actually showed uh, much more greater collection uh, in terms of sales tax than it was done in the federal uh, government times. Um, our scorecard, uh, however, um, there are many, uh, very few factors which we had to ex exclude, and it didn't affect much in terms of the overall assessment of the economic uh, situation. I hope that I correctly get your question. Great. Uh, thanks very much. Hi, this is Leah Gregg, also from DAI. And I was wondering, could you speak more to, uh, within the economic revival scorecard, job opportunities and job creation, and uh, kind of go a little more in depth into what that's measuring and what are some of the policy uh, policy development or implementation that the government has been moving towards? Yeah, sure. Um, now, this, this government had announced a um, uh, couple of schemes uh, for job creation at, at the at the national level. One of the scheme is called the Prime Minister Youth Business Loan Scheme, which is actually uh, targeted at uh, the disbursement of loans. And um, so far, six to you can say six to nine months in progress. The you know we can see that progress has happened in that particular area. Uh, the other um, the other measure for this particular indicator was the extent of private sector credit, which I has already noted has increased um, in last one one year. So on the basis of that, we have. Uh, this notion that job opportunities are are being created. However, there is also um, an additional point here. Uh, the Pakistan Bureau of Statistics recently uh, also released um, its um, an assessment of unemployment situation in the country. Um, although there's a lot of problem, uh, to be honest, with its methodology and definition of what is uh, unemployment, but 
the official statistics are that unemployment in Pakistan is about 5.5 percent. But it's really hard to believe. So I, I would say we will stick to what the government has promised in its manifesto and where how we do assess it. Um, Mr. Sena, I wonder if you could, um, if you could comment as well, sort of on the overall economic situation in Pakistan, um, particularly the job situation and the energy crisis, and your thoughts on um, the direction that that is going now, um, and some of the steps that the government uh, you think should take. Um, regarding employment, I've always found the the numbers put out by the Bureau of Statistics to be uh, uh, very, very problematic. I find it very hard to work with them. Um, that's because I've dealt directly with business people and I'll tell you, I'll give you one example. Um, I went to an industrial uh, estate, one of the largest in Pakistan, and I wanted to know how many people they hire, how many people they employ. And uh, I was told by the chairman of that industrial estate that they themselves don't maintain that data. They said that most of the people we hire is on contract labor, they're, they're with us today, they're gone tomorrow. Most people in Pakistan who are, most workers in Pakistan work under those terms. They, they, they have a job today, they may not have it tomorrow. Um, and the uh, wages are indexed to minimum wage, although in many cases they're being paid less than minimum wage. Uh, but even the factory owners themselves don't maintain the data of how many people they hired. At the end of the month, the factory owner himself can't tell you uh, how many people he hired because they literally hire people, they, they, they work, they, they're, paid out, they're paid out in cash and then they leave. Um, they've got some idea on their permanent payroll, but, uh, but but total employment figures, if factory people themselves don't have it, if employers themselves don't have it, I don't see how the state can. Um, so I have a very hard time actually uh, running with uh, with employment data. Um, so it, it, it's, it, it becomes very difficult to say uh, whether or not the, 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 this sort of economic turnaround the government is touting is one that creates employment or, or whether it's one that's, uh, that creates profits only and no jobs. Uh, it's, it's difficult to say we can surmise, but, but there, there's no real uh, quantitative grounds. Um, regarding the, the, the energy crisis, I mean, um, do you wanted overall thoughts or...? Um, um, this is a long-term problem. Um, there are two major issues uh, that that the government is up against, uh, and you know we've had three governments try to, to uh, tackle these uh, these issues and fail in the process. So we're waiting to see whether this government proves itself any different. Uh, issue number one is the gro the, the the deteriorating fuel mix uh, over the past quarter century or so, the role that oil is playing in the, in the generation of electricity has been growing bigger and bigger. And um, up until 2002, 2003, that wasn't seen as a big problem because uh, oil wasn't that expensive. And uh, much of the thermal requirements for the power plants came from indigenous natural gas. But from 2002 till now, in the past one decade, uh, oil prices have shot up and natural gas production has come down and number of stakeholders on the natural gas side has increased as well. So um, so, so with this double whammy, in fact, uh, you know, uh, diminishing uh, supplies of indigenous gas, rising costs of uh, imported oil, uh, that's really at the root of what we call the, the, the power crisis. It's not that there's not enough capacity to generate the electricity, it's that there isn't enough capacity to pay for the, the, the electricity that we can generate. So much of the, the Gen generation capacity sits idle. And uh, number two is, of course, the, the power bureaucracy. This is one of the most powerful bureaucracies in the country. And um, <clears throat> I've, I've had a chance to see it up close. In the year 2008, I made a, do a documentary series on the power crisis in which I actually went to and stayed for a few days in each of the power plants, the public sector power plants in Pakistan. I spent a few days over there interacting with the, in, in each of them. Um, and then also in the coal fields in, uh, in Lakhra. And um, um, it was it, it, it was very easy to see that uh, the, the inefficiencies um, that, that, that are there and uh, the enormous difficulty that the independent board of governors uh, that were installed by the last government were having in ensuring compliance. And uh, you know, the last government installed independent boards on each of the distribution companies and uh, the boards found that the management just was not responding to them, just not taking instructions, not uh, complying with uh, with uh, uh, any 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 directives. Uh, 
So getting the power bureaucracy to actually respond to reform-minded in- initiatives is a big challenge. And um, the Musharraf government tried it, the, the, the previous government tried it. We'll wait to see if this government manages to succeed. Of course, one wishes that they do. Thanks very much. Uh, Mark, the, the same basic question. Um, the, um, what are your thoughts on the overall situation of poverty and, um, and jobs um, uh, in Pakistan and what you think needs to be done? Well, I, you know, um, I mean, I, I think to a certain extent I'll, I have to kind of sidestep your question because um, sort of from a, you know, I, mean, I think there's two reasons. First of all, you know, sort of from a from a SIPE point of view, we we tend to defer to the experts in terms of of uh, commenting on on um, the very specifics. Um, but also, I think from a from a from an overall point of view, also, I, I, you know, I think as as both Ali and Horam have pointed out, you know, there's there there are a lot of um, structural and institutional um, arrangements that also need to be negotiated. I think going forward, um, you know, Ali's report very clearly indicates. I think that there's a certain amount of momentum and that there's a certain amount of um, there are there are a certain amount of of of, uh, of of positive signs and changes that have been introduced, but you know, Horam rightly pointed out also that uh, it's in terms of the the structural arrangements and the institutional arrangements and the implementation, uh, you know, where where the rubber is going to really meet the road, um, and um, I think both Ali and Horam have also pointed to the. Uh, to the difficulties in, in getting the statistics right. Um, and, um, you know, I think that one thing that I, I hear coming from both of their comments is that uh, to some extent the government is is in a little bit of a difficult position where they have these uh, dueling pressures of economic revival, which would uh, seem to, let's say, mitigate in, in favor of uh, re- relaxing um, certain um, certain tax burdens on the private sector, yet at the same time, we also uh, know that the IMF, as Horan pointed out, is putting a lot of pressure in terms of ramping up tax collection, um, and that was something that was also, I think, reflected in Andrew's question as well. So uh, those those dueling pressures are there. So you know, I think very much so, the jury is still out. Ali, we have about, um, uh, oh, um, Mr. Sullivan, please. Go on. Just a very small, well, it's actually a very large question, but it's a very small point. And that is, if you're in the private sector and you're running a company and you don't know how much you've spent on employment, how can you put together a P&L sheet? I don't know. Um, the... You know, they, they they will have aggregate data on uh, on on how much they've uh, put into their company um, in in terms of you know they, they'll have two separate payrolls for one the one that's for the contract labor which is where the bulk of their work is coming from maybe a third one the third one for the taxpayer maybe tax collector maybe. But um, um, there, there'll be one for the contract labor that is higher on the day-to-day basis, which is the majority of the workforce. Uh, and then there'll be another one for the permanent. Uh, and that, that data they'll have. They'll have an HR department and they'll, they'll be able to tell you. But how many people have actually worked there over the past one month, they won't be able to tell you. But they might be able to tell you what their, their, their total bill was over the past one month, what they paid. But how many people that that represented, we don't know. So, you know, that, that makes it difficult to assess how many people entered the workforce. You might be able to get some data on, uh, on, on how much they paid in, in, a, in a monthly period or something. But, uh, or, but, but, but it'll be very hard for you to get numbers of people that are entering the workforce, basically. So it sounds like both the public and the private sectors um, have some reforms that they need to undertake. Um usefully so. Um, Ali, we have about uh, 30 seconds remaining, so I'll give you the final word. Yeah, it's a pleasure being uh, all of you. Um, one final thought I wanted to share is that I think the audience and the friends of Pakistan in Washington, D.C. needs to look Pakistan uh, beyond, uh, I would say, 
the security lens or security perspective not uh, happening in pakistan uh, in terms of economic activity um well we've lost ali um but that's okay um the the um his point is well taken um and in fact that's something that our program has been has done the last few years we did a lot of work on security the security relationship between the united states and pakistan uh but about two three years ago we really started shifting the focus to um more uh, private sector development um trade um uh, issues in fact right now um my fellow uh, sadiqa hamid is in pakistan um uh, wrapping up um this year's study um, on the on the state of investment and entrepreneurship in Pakistan, which will be out sometime in the next few months. Um, so, um, with apologies to uh, to Ali, which we'll send separately, um, I'd like to thank uh, Ali Saman of of Prime, Khurram Hussein of the Wilson Center, um, and um, Mark, John, and Jennifer of Sipe um, for uh, for organizing this, and um, thank all of you for coming today.